Grace, Grace and peace to all of you and welcome to Sleepy Hollow Presbyterian Church this Sunday, January 10th by Zoom. We're so glad you're here this morning after this tumultuous and distressing week from our nation's capital across our nation. We need to gather our hearts today in prayer. This is also, as it happens, the first Sunday of our January series. Uh, January often is devoted to racial justice and criminal justice in the Presbyterian Church, and we always make uh, quite a, a lot of effort to remember Dr. King next Sunday and his legacy and life work. Um, and so because we now have a racial equity team uh, that has been hard at work under the leadership of Betsy Fox and Reverend Charles Way and just a fantastic team and you're all welcome to participate. Um, we are dedicating these next today and these next few Sundays to really exploring the question of what would racial justice look like? What, 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 what would it look like? We have to really open our minds and hearts to grapple with that extremely fundamental, meaningful question for our, our own lives, our community and our country. Um, so we're looking at that today and I'm glad you're here to embark on that exploration together as a community. Now, today is also the second Sunday of the month. And so we celebrate January birthdays and anniversaries. So we'd love to know uh, from you by chat. Uh, so I'm opening up my chat. Um, all right, so I see that we have uh, in the January birthdays, Carol Brannon, Carter and Van Ike Stewart's grandmother. Oh, and thank you from our Zoom producer, Janelle Leatherman Stewart is remembering me on January 15, a day I share with Dr. King and Laura East, Reverend Laura East, our former intern and now pastor down at Brentwood Presbyterian on January 13th. So yeah, so that's some good birthdays. Okay, from Kristen Rivers, Abigail turns eight on the 22nd. Oh, wonderful. Charles says his mother, Nora, and Aunt Maravick, both on January 1st, and his sister, Diane, on the 24th. All right. Oh, we've got a, a good number of January birthdays. Um, Jenny Gallagher-Gelman, her brother, Charlie's birthday is on the 21st. Ahmed tells us that Robin's dad is also January 15th. I had forgotten, Robin, that your dad was my birthday buddy. Nancy Elberg, I knew that, January 21st. Yes, indeed. And let's see, Millie Millar. Millie always has a lot of wonderful family birthdays. January 3rd, Tanya and Molly, her granddaughters. Both on January 3rd. That's awesome, Millie. Okay, now I think Linda Peltzman may not have signed on yet, but I'm pretty sure Linda Peltzman is a January birthday. Anybody else? Let's see. I'm moving my chat up to see if there's anyone else. Any bold folks get married in January? I don't think I've ever done a January wedding. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's see, Hallie says, oh, her best friend, Nick, turns 50 on the 21st of January. Yes, Nick. All right, good. Okay, oops. Uh, yes, oh, January 21st, Millie's grandson, Billy, and Pat is on the 26th. Yes, your son-in-law, Pat. Absolutely, Millie. People are typing as fast as they can. <laughs> it's always a really good community celebration to look, you know, lift up each other's birthdays. Okay, so January birthdays, and, and we have a lot, and we know right in our own immediate community, we have Abigail Rivers and Nancy Elberg, and I'm gonna say Linda Peltzman, who I bet is gonna be signing in any moment. So January birthdays. God blessed you the day you were born, and God has blessed you every day since. Believe this good news. You are beloved of God, and God wants you to enjoy this month when we celebrate your birthday and to have a blessed year to come. May you be blessed this day and always. Amen. All right. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Mm -hmm. 
live in Christ ever present we welcome you in our lives live in Christ ever present we welcome you Now let us join together in the call to worship. We come from near and far to worship today. We gather in peace and harmony. Though we are different, we are one body in Christ. We celebrate our differences and our oneness in God. Now let us sing hymn number 301, All Are Welcome. Build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of Now let us join together in unison prayer. Creator God, you have made us in your likeness, male and female, dark-skinned and light-skinned, big and small. We are all made in your likeness. Help us to appreciate and love the diversity of us. Fill us with joy, peace, and love as we move through the world embracing our differences as your creations and reflections of who you are. Now let us take a moment to quietly lift up to God things that we need to let go of today.
Amen. People of God, hear the good news. You are loved exactly as you are. Yours is the face of our divine creator. Never forget that. You are a special creation of God, each and every one of you. Unique, inspiring, beautiful, and good. So be at peace and know that you bring goodness and peace to everyone that you meet. Amen. Now as the people of God, living in God's grace and God's mercy, I invite you to share the peace with one another. And the way that we do that on Zoom is through chat. So make sure that you select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see it. The peace, the peace of, of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please pass the peace. Peace be still, peace be still, the storm rages, peace be still, peace be still, peace The storm rages, peace be still. Sorry. <laughs> so good morning, children. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you on Zoom this morning. Last week, we had a really fun word to talk about, and that was epiphany. I love how it sounds. So we were saying epiphany, epiphany, and epiphany has a wonderful meaning and a wonderful story about the Magi following the star of Bethlehem on their quest and they found exactly what they were looking for, the baby Jesus, the light of the world, the grace and the truth of the world, exactly what they were seeking on their quest. They were so satisfied when they went home. Now this week, we have another really important word, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is part of our first value for our children's program, respect. Now remember our four values for our children's program are respect, whoops, respect, <laughs> kindness, sharing, and planet care. Respect, kindness, sharing, and planet care, right? So part of respect is acknowledgement because acknowledgement is accepting the truth or the existence of, of someone or something. The Bible makes a really big point about truth. It's in the Ten Commandments, number nine, not to bear false witness against your neighbor, which basically means be truthful. Don't tell a lie that would hurt anyone, right? Be truthful. And Jesus in his teachings made a huge point about truth. First, the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus is the truth full of truth. And Jesus in his own teachings to his followers made a huge point that we need to be truthful and walk in truth. And that, that if we're turning away from truth, we're turning away from, from him, from God. We need to turn back to truth. So this is part of acknowledgement. Truth is essential to, to acknowledgement and, and to respect, right? Now, your grown-ups may have spoken with you 
about what happened this week in our nation's capital in Washington, DC. I grew up right next to Washington, DC. It was my, my first idea of what a city was, was our nation's capital. It's very dear in my heart. And I know uh, uh, probably a lot of you have visited Washington, DC with your parents. Our teens have gone to Washington, DC on school field trips. And, and if you've been there or just seen a lot of good pictures, you remember there's this beautiful long grassy rectangle called the mall, but it's not a shopping mall. There's no stores. There's just wonderful museums. Um, and on one end is the big monument for Abraham Lincoln, the president who signed the Emancipation Proclamation to free the slaves in the Civil War. Most, one of the most important things that's ever happened in our country's history. And then in the middle is that pencil thing that's the Washington Monument to our first president, George Washington. And then on the other end is the United States Capitol, a very grand building where our lawmakers come together to make our laws. Now, the really terrible thing that happened this week is that, as you know, there was an election in November for president and Joe Biden won the election. But the loser did not acknowledge that. The loser kept lying and saying that he had won. He did not, he did not. It was a fair election, there was no evidence that it was not, but the loser wouldn't tell the truth and wouldn't acknowledge that he lost. And a lot of people believed him. And some of them got very, very angry and last Wednesday, they actually did uh, go into our Capitol and disrespect it and um, tore down the United States flag and, and seriously hurt some people. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing for our nation that this has happened. And it, and it shows us what happens when people lie, when people don't acknowledge the truth. Acknowledging the truth is absolutely essential. And it's a part of growing up following Jesus and being a person of good character. It's not always clear what the truth is. This truth was tested in 60 courts of law, which is one of the places in our country where we determine what's true. You remember I used to be a lawyer. Um, so something about you know Jesus that we learn at the beginning of the gospel of John is that Jesus is full of grace and truth. There'll be many times in life where you'll be asked to follow someone who you think is an okay person to follow. And then it turns out that that person is on the wrong path and taking you someplace where you know you shouldn't go. Turn around, turn around and you will experience the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness and the acceptance, right? We have to walk in truth. If we're not, we need to turn around. And, and walk in grace. So the acknowledgement that we were meaning to do today is to the Miwok Indians. I think a lot of you have learned about the Miwok Indians in school. So what we want to do in this month where we're talking about justice for all people, everybody, is to make sure that native people, indigenous people, we used to call them Indians, and I know a lot of native people, I work with them in our national church, on issues about their land. And, uh, and they call each other Indians, but we call them native people or indigenous people uh, now to be most respectful and polite. And, and we wanna make sure that we acknowledge, tell the truth about the land that we walk on, live on and worship on. They were here first, it's their land. They, they feel that that needs to be acknowledged and we want to respect that. So your wonderful children's program co-director, Ava Podboy has prepared for us this morning, a land acknowledgement. And uh, I'll go to Ava now. Hi everyone. So like Bev was saying, we're gonna talk a little bit more about land acknowledgement, which is really just a way to recognize the traditional territory of indigenous people who called the land home before any settlers. And a lot of times it's common to open gatherings and events by acknowledging the traditional inhabitants or people that lived on and took care of the land long before anyone else. 
So in countries all over the world, like New Zealand and Australia and Canada, um, we acknowledge the land and it's something that the United, the United States is starting to adopt because we want to respect the native people that originally occupied the land. So like Bev was saying, one example of land acknowledgement is that here in Marin, we are on the land of the Miwok people who have lived here for over 13,000 years, so a really long time. And when we name the Miwok people, we're honoring and respecting their history and their culture because native people are known leaders in honoring our earth and all life. So we really just want to join with them and working together on planet care, like Bev was saying, and justice and peace. Oh yes, and back to Bev. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ava. That's a really good acknowledgement. Let us join together in prayer. Children, you know that Jesus loves you. The Bible tells us that again and again. So feel that love of God in your heart that lives inside you and surrounds you. And know that Jesus calls you to be truth tellers and justice seekers this day and always. May you be blessed. Amen.
Thank you so much. Um, so now I want to invite you to acknowledge the land on which we worship. Eva explained that and offered up a land acknowledgement, and, and we're going to just pick up from that. And uh, I'll just say that acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way to show respect and take a step toward correcting the stories and practices that erase Indigenous people's history and culture and towards inviting and honoring their truth. For more than 500 years, Native communities across the Americas have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of violent efforts to separate them from their land, their culture, and each other. So I invite you to take part in spirit with this uh, Coast Miwok land acknowledgement that was offered up at TAM High School composed by Lorraine Ortega with the help of Lucina Baduri of the Coast Miwok people, Serena Campbell, a Drake alum, and Jason Ortega of the Chiricahua Apache Mescalero Apache Reservation, adapted for, our, for us today. We are worshiping on the traditional lands of the Coast Miwok people who have inhabited Marin and Sonoma areas for more than 13,000 years. Having survived cultural genocide through missionization by the Spanish and the piracy tactics of the English, the Coast Miwok people are currently working to reclaim their past by sharing their history and working on a cultural center. This land acknowledgement should be seen as a first step in working with the Coast Miwok to help them reclaim their place in this community through concrete action and substance. May it be so. to the sky to the sky.
reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness it stretches to the sky I'm reading from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let us join together in prayer. God in heaven, you are our creator, our redeemer and our sustainer. Be with us now as we listen for your word. In Jesus name we pray, amen. So when I was growing up in the Philippines, she would watch movies about the United States and for her, it was almost like America was a mythical land where everyone was rich and beautiful and they all did amazing things. It was so far removed from her day-to-day -day experience that it might as well have been another planet. And as she explained this to me, is kind of strange. See, in her mind, because everyone in America was rich and successful, that meant all of the things people used were made of fine materials like silver or gold or porcelain, not like the Philippines, which is a relatively poor country where people use things made out of plastic. She always talks about how surprised she was when she first arrived to the United States and saw that it wasn't all the glitz and glamor of Hollywood and that people here also used plastic forks and spoons and cups. Coming to America was a very different experience for each of my parents. My father was from Manila, uh, the capital of the Philippines, a bustling urban city, and he was college educated with a degree in electrical engineering. He joined the US Navy as an officer, which helped him to immigrate into this country. There's these two pictures at my parents' house of my dad at the end of his Navy officer candidate school with all of his classmates. The first one is serious. I think it's something like 50 men all in uniform, all looking straight at the camera with serious expressions on their face. The second one is the silly picture, all of them making silly faces and grabbing at each other. But the one thing that always stood out for me that was that my dad was the only person of color in that group. And I always wondered what that was like for him, especially in the 70s, because I remember what it was like for me so many times in seminary and how many times I would be in a room full of people and realize that I was the only person of color in the 2010s. And I don't think I experienced much in the way of discrimination, but it always felt a little weird when I noticed it. And I would always think about how often my life would, in my life, I'd find myself in that kind of situation. So I can only imagine what it was like for my dad going through officer candidate school as the only person of color in his class in the seventies. But still, he had a much easier time of it than my mom. When my mom immigrated here, she didn't speak English and she didn't know anybody. And almost immediately upon her arrival, my dad was sent off to be on a ship for two months 
leaving my mother, who was very young at the time, only in her mid-20s, so, you know, not that much life experience yet, alone in a strange place where she didn't speak the language and she didn't have any friends for two months. She always talks about how she hid in the apartment the entire time that my dad was gone, living off of the food that he had stockpiled for her. I imagine her peeking through the blinds at the outside world, somehow scared and bored at the same time, wondering if my dad was ever gonna come back. And while this was admittedly a, a pretty harrowing experience for her, it's not that bad compared to what some immigrants had to go through. We as a congregation have been exploring this topic for years now. We've talked about the detention centers and how so many children were separated from their families. We've talked about refugee camps in different parts of the world. Leaving home and moving to a strange land is not something that people do lightly. People leave their homes because they have to. I think about Jesus as an immigrant sometimes. I wonder what he might have thought about being here on earth. I mean, I know he came as a baby, so I'm guessing he wasn't really aware of everything that was happening around him at first, but you know, he grew up and he eventually started to realize who he was as he listened to the stories that his mother would tell about the angel coming to talk to her and telling her that she was pregnant with him and the shepherds and the wise men come to visit him after his birth, you know, these events that marked him as something other, something different. I have to imagine that he would wonder where he came from. And I think about the kinds of things that would go through his mind, you know, did he belong here? Would he ever be accepted? His first moments were so tumultuous. There was a king who was trying to kill him he was a baby. He hadn't done anything at all, let alone something wrong. And already he was being hunted because of who he was. A lot of immigrants can empathize with that feeling of being hunted, especially those who are undocumented. There's a lot of fear of getting caught and imprisoned and being shipped away, separated from their families. And even people who aren't immigrants, people who were born here, but they're black or they're brown, and they're always having to contend with people looking at them suspiciously, people being afraid of them, people calling the cops on them, people killing them. We don't have to look any further events of this last week to see examples of how differently people are treated based on the color of their skin. The group of mostly white people who stormed our nation's capital to prevent the certification of the presidential election were met with minimal resistance by Capitol Police. Compare that with the exaggerated response by the National Guard to the peaceful march for the Black Lives Matter movement this, su this last summer. Have any of you seen those side-by-side -side pictures of those two events? It's shocking how different they are. I don't know who it was that taught me that I was an outsider because I don't remember it coming from my parents, but it was something that I was always acutely aware of. I always knew that I didn't look like everyone else and I somehow also knew that that was bad. People don't have to be overt about it. It's part of our culture, it's part of the atmosphere. And even as a child who didn't understand what microaggressions were, that stuff gets under your skin. It seeps into your mind, poisoning your thoughts about who you are and what you're worth. I remember the first time my family went to Yellowstone National Park. I think I was 10 years old. My parents decided that we should have dinner at one of the park restaurants. This was very exciting for us kids because we almost never went out to eat. Now, even though I was really young, I somehow still understood that we were in middle America. And I got the idea into my head that when people saw us, they probably assumed that we were just another tourist family from Asia instead of the American citizens that we actually were. And for some reason, 
I really didn't want people thinking that about us. So I remember making the very intentional decision to speak very loudly in my unaccented English to make it abundantly clear to anyone listening that I was not a foreigner, that English was my native language and that we belong there just as much as anyone else. What a strange thought for a 10 year old child to have. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because if you're listening to me right now, you're probably trying to be a good person and you're probably trying not to do racist things. But the world and our country in particular is still a racist place. And it is still not as welcoming to immigrants as it should be. God doesn't discriminate. And as we are all part of God's family, we need to do our part to make the world a better place so that children don't have to grow up thinking that they're less than because they're different from the people around them. That means speaking up when you see someone being mistreated and it means working and voting to make sure that laws are in place to protect minority groups. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was constantly telling his followers to take care of the neediest and least fortunate in society. Right now, in this time, some of the neediest and least fortunate are the immigrants and people of color. It is our jobs as Christians to take care of our fellow human beings. We are God's hands and God's feet in the world. So let's get to work. Amen. Am I on screen too? I can't tell. I'm supposed yeah. to be. Yes, I am. Okay, good. I must have my, um, I must be in the wrong format somehow. All right, but I'm on screen with Charles. Okay, so as we come to our time of prayer, I just want to say first, thank you all so, so much for your prayers for Michael. It was a huge help. He had total knee replacement um, surgery and uh, on Monday, and, uh, and he, um, he uh, had a bad reaction to the anesthesia initially. And so the first couple days were really, really difficult, but your prayers uh, brought him through and he's doing much better today. And uh, thank you all so much for your support and love and prayers because that has really, really helped him. Um, and so I, I just want to say thank you first for that. Keep praying <laughs> by all means. And I also want to make sure that we're going to be offering up special prayers um, for uh, Denise Waite, director of the preschool's mother uh, in Almavia, where there's a lot of COVID. Also for our dear Bob Steiner, um, who was in the hospital this week for full and complete recovery. And... Um, and of course, for our nation, 
with our dual crises, with the pandemic and with our democracy. So oh, let's bring our hearts together in prayer. Holy One, we know that you hear all of our prayers spoken and unspoken. And in times of deep, deep trouble, sometimes we can't speak a prayer. We just oh, go to you for help. And this week was one of those times when the events of this week in Washington unfolded and, and we were just watched in horror. We lift up prayers for our nation, God. May our nation return to the path of truth and justice. May we have a safe inauguration in 10 days. And may we be governed by people who are telling the truth and honoring elections and honoring democracy and addressing this pandemic and working for the health and well being of all people. Justice for all people. Please guide us, God. Give us strength. Give us moral courage in this time. We ask for God's comfort and healing on all those who are suffering in every way because of the COVID pandemic. We ask for God to strengthen our responders and healthcare providers, everyone in the hospitals, everyone working so hard to try to prevent death and keep people safe. We ask for the resolve to continue doing the COVID precautions. We have to keep going at least a few more months. We ask for God's grace on the vaccination distribution that it may be equitable and effective and speedy. We ask for God's comfort for the bereaved who have lost their loved ones, 350,000 and counting loved ones lost in this last year from COVID. We ask for God's healing and comfort and accompaniment for everyone who's struggling with every kind of difficulty. So many now who are lonely, who are in financial hardship, who are struggling with mental health and substance issues. We ask for God's comfort to be manifest and ask for us to be guided to be God's hands and feet and heart in this world. Prayers for our dear Bob Steiner. May he experience healing and comfort and, and, and energy from his beautiful uh, attached faith in God and his, his spirit be uplifted. We ask for prayers for Kat Caldwell's family, her father and her sister-in-law. God in your grace, you hear our prayers. And now Charles and I are here to look at the Q&A and offer up any prayers that you would like to share with the congregation at this time. So just go down to your Q&A and let us know. Um, okay, uh, do you wanna start Charles? Sure. Nancy Elberg lifts up her niece, Lee. Uh, she asked that she's rescued from her very troubled life. Uh, God, we ask for protection for Lee for anyone uh, who is experiencing hardship and troubles, God in your grace. You hear our prayers. I would like to lift up prayers. Uh, a lot of people are starting to receive the COVID vaccine and some people are having some pretty negative reactions to that, including some friends of mine. Oh. God in your grace. You hear our prayers. The Bakery family lifts up prayers for teens who are waiting to go back to school. Their return date to school has been delayed again. Prayers mm -hmm. for all of our teens, all of our school children, for peace and a sense of purpose. Indeed. May God grant these children and their families 
the strength and the, the fortitude and the patience to deal with this unprecedented year out of school. And may they have peace and a sense of purpose in this time. God in your grace. You hear our prayers. Jenny Gelman lifts up prayers for her dear mother and love, Eileen Rossman, who passed away this day three years ago. Um, she is missed. Uh, God, we thank you for the life of Eileen, and we pray for all of the people who are still here and still remember her. We ask that you bring peace to their hearts and uh, let them have continued fond, fond memories of Eileen. God, in your grace. You hear our prayers. Peg McLeese lists up prayers for her daughter who will be admitted to the hospital on Tuesday to begin the birth of her daughter, Peg's first granddaughter. Oh, we lift up prayers for everything to go beautifully, for health, safety, well-being, for new baby and mother and whole family. May this be a week of great joy for the McLeese family. Welcome this little baby to this world with love and joy. God in your grace, you, you hear our prayers. prayers. The Bagri family lifts up a beloved family member who received a breast cancer diagnosis this week. Uh, they ask for prayers for as best as possible prognosis when she meets with the doctors tomorrow. God, we ask that your presence be with the Bagri family, that uh, you extend your healing hands on, on this family member uh, cancer is so scary. Just please be with them and comfort them. God, in your grace, we hear our prayers. And now let's say together the Lord's Prayer and choose the name for God that uh, brings your heart most open and close to God. Uh, let us pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, thank you so much, Charles. It's my and thank you for your good words this morning. You're a blessing. It is my great honor now to introduce to the congregation the Reverend Eric Bean. Um, Eric is uh, good morning, Eric. Good morning. <laughs> Eric is the um, a uh, transitional mission presbyter for the Presbytery of the Redwoods, um, which means he's Bob Conover's successor, Dr. Bob Conover's successor. Eric joined our Presbytery as transitional mission presbyter in September of 2020. And he's already come down and visited us at Sleepy Hollow Church. But of course, I was the only one there to greet him. He wasn't able to come to meet all of you in person yet because of COVID, of course. But um, he has uh, been pastor to congregations in Savannah, Georgia, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, he's a community organizer uh, from before that, Harvard Divinity School. And I'm going to let him just tell a little bit of, for all of us about um, you know, what he does as Transitional Mission Presbyter, um, uh, along with his colleague, friend of our church, stated clerk, Ariel Mink who of course um, most of you remember from Ariel attending our meet, congregational meeting and uh, being a, a great assistance to the church. But I, I wanted Eric to have a chance to address you and, and mostly for us to all say, welcome Eric. Thank you so much. And it is such a privilege for me to be with you today. I had actually intended to, to come down your way uh, when you were meeting outdoors, but uh, wasn't able to make it. And now of course um, we're all we're all at home, so uh, it's great to be able to be with you today. As Bev said, I have been the Transitional Mission Presbyter for the Presbytery of the Redwoods since September 20th. Um, since then, I have uh, had a chance to get out and get to know some of the congregations and especially some of the pastors in the, in the Presbytery. Um, 
It's a wonderful Presbyterian, such a, a delightful part of the world to be in, um, and some really wonderful people here uh, which uh, who serve our congregations. Um, I also uh, provide staff support for a number of our committees. I, I oversee the staff of the Presbytery and am working on a number of other things. Uh, so as you all know, of course, 2020 has been a very uh, difficult year and we, many of us are just as happy as anything to have that behind us. Um, but uh, throughout 2020, the Presbytery has continued to work hard especially uh, since I came on board, the things that we've really uh, had to pay attention to is partly to reach out to our congregations and provide support to our clergy as they have navigated all the difficulties of the pandemic. Uh, it is a very stressful time and there's a lot of worry on a lot of different levels in all of the congregations, both for health and uh, for safety, but also for um, the finances and the, the management of the church programs all of the ways that we've had to, to pivot and to change and to grow in new directions that we never imagined we would have to. Um, I, it has been my privilege to go out to congregations, including yours, to remind folks that you're not alone, uh, that everybody is facing many of these same difficulties and that uh, the Presbytery is here, not with solutions because there are no, no solutions to the, to the issues, but to support and to guide and to provide whatever resources we can. Um, also, same with our pastors. Um, Bev and I had a wonderful conversation when I went down to visit with her, uh, and we've been able to meet with our clergy on a regular basis to, um, to provide support and, and help them support each other with new ideas and new, new ways of addressing some of the issues. We're also um, dealing with the fires, of course, uh, in, in the fall this year. Um, we're working with Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to provide some uh, workshops for our clergy and also for members of our congregations uh, to help uh, with the emotional and spiritual resilience in the face of the fires, given that the fires will continue. Uh, unfortunately, we just have to accept the reality and to adapt to the reality that uh, every year this is going to be an issue now in our part of the world. So how can we come together to provide emotional and spiritual support for each other uh, the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance uh, through the Presbyterian Mission Agency is working uh, closely with us. Uh, we're doing some other things to um, some of the issues that you're working on. We've got a small group of folks who are working on reaching out to some of our indigenous populations in Northern California in the bounds of our Presbytery to really build relationships and to see how it is that we can come alongside them and acknowledge, as Pastor Bev says, uh, some of the atrocities that have happened in the past to come to understand our the doctrine of discovery, which provided the theological foundation for 500 years of oppression of all kinds of different people who are not European, uh, and uh, to learn and to grow together so that we might uh, bring about greater justice and have more authentic relationships with our neighbors. So uh, those are some efforts that are going on in the Presbytery right now. You'll hear more about those. Certainly Bev will We'll hear about them and we try and get the communication out, out, out about them as much as we can. Um, again, it's just a real privilege to be here and to bring a greeting on behalf of the uh, other 47 congregations of the Presbytery, over 4,000 members throughout those congregations to you at uh, Sleepy Hollow Presbyterian Church. Thank you so much for your welcome. And we are, and I'm, it's, it's been wonderful to worship with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Eric Bean, and I also welcome your wife, your partner, Reverend Mary Bean, who is uh, our colleague uh, pastoring the Windsor Presbyterian Church, and your son Isaac. Welcome to all of you, and we're just so glad you've been worshiping with us today. We look forward to that bright day when you can come and preach for us in person back in our sanctuary. So that, that's a day we're looking forward to. Thank you for all of your good work at the Presbytery. Thank you so much. And now um, I call for the offering, uh, which is always an awkward transition for me, but I do wanna say uh, Reverend Bean did mention that this time has been a financial challenge for church because of course we're not in person. We did manage to do outdoor service half of last year, which was really great. And Christmas Eve was a high point of my life, but, um, but you all have been fantastic. You know we're self-supporting, you know that it's you that makes the church run and you have been so faithful in your financial support of the church. So I just wanna thank you so much. 
Um, this is your opportunity uh, to either go online and pledge if you haven't yet pledged yet. Uh, I see the link is in chat of the donate page on the website or give through Venmo or PayPal, which is like us passing the basket. And then many of you uh, have your checks sent to the church or stick a check in the black box and all that is so appreciated. So let's dedicate our offering together. Holy God, we dedicate every penny that's given to the church to bring about more goodness, more of your love and justice and goodness and feeding the hungry to this world in your name, amen. Thank you, the morning offering will be taken and Alex will offer for us his offertory. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Cause your love never fails Um, we have only one announcement today, and that is that, uh, well, I'm going to say we have two. Uh, so one is that youth group is by Zoom today at 11 o'clock. And, um, and then I'll say that the second one is that this is our racial equity teams uh, month to, um, you know, to ask us to all uh, really participate in exploring this question. What does racial justice look like? So I, I'm going to say uh, as an announcement that you are welcome to participate in this work and that Dennis Lada, and I think he may be co-leading with Jean Marquis, but that there's a book group a coming and you'll see the invitation in this Thursday's newsletter to read Trevor Noah's book, 
um, and really have some great discussion of that book. So I'm going to announce the book club coming from the racial equity team and, uh, and details to follow, but please look for that in your uh, newsletter this Thursday. And, um, and let's, let's all really get enthusiastic about this work. So, so that would be our announcements. Now, our last hymn is number 697, Take My Life and Let It Be. This is just a way to really dedicate your life to God. And it's, um, that's a beautiful thing to do. So Alex will lead us. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my sin. People of God, go out into the world and do the good works that God needs you to do. Protect those who need to be protected. Be the peacemakers and truth tellers that the world needs. Be brave and know that God is with you. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.